वी आर वेलकम बैक टू आर पोस्ट लंच टेक्निकल सेशन मे रिक्वेस्ट एवरी वन इन केस योर फ्रेंड्स आर आउटसाइड द इन केस योर फ्रेंड्स आर आउटसाइड द हॉल सो काइंडली आस देम टू प्लीज बी सीटेड कम इन साइड वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट विद आर टेक्निकल सेशन respected members kaise hai respected members nahi wo salute nahi hai aapka aawaz ke liye yeah okay we yeah, are dear friends uh, we are going to start with our uh, third technical session of the day fifth session so may i request our esteemed speakers for this session to kindly come on the dais I am requesting uh, Madam Jodsa Jodsna Sitling, Member Advisory Committee to SEBI on Stock Exchange, S Social Stock. Yeah. May I now request Miss Ekta uh, Kumar to please take the, uh, her seat on the dais. Shri Sudip Sudipta Das. May I request Dr. Birendra Raturi, sir? Actually, since uh, some of the people are still having lunch, so they will be joining us shortly. We have with us uh, Chairman of GS 2023. So I will request uh, to please uh, welcome our panel. so that we can proceed for our uh, technical session yeah so yeah i am requesting uh, h padman abhan sir to please uh, felicitate miss jyotna uh, jyotsna sitling ma'am member advisory committee to sebi on social stock exchange uh, i request to cm me ashish pi tatte dr ashish tatte ashish bhai to please join me on the dais to welcome the dignitaries thank you may yeah may i request uh, sir to please felicitate miss ekta kumar independent esg and csr advisor Thank you, ma'am, for joining with us uh, today. May I now request, uh, sir, to please felicitate Sri Sudipta Das, partner, Future Station ESG.
May I now request sir to please felicitate Dr. Barendra Raturi, International Director, SR Asia. Thank you, sir, for joining with us. We have very uh, interesting topic uh, for this technical session, Green enter Entrepreneurship and Global Dimensions of ESNG in Search of Excellence. Green Entrepreneurship focuses on sustainable business models and technologies that address environmental challenges. By striving for excellence, green entrepreneur contribute to environmental and social sustainability while considering the global impacts of their businesses. With lit, uh, these little uh, opening words, I will ask or request our uh, panel to please take up the session. First of all, I'll request our uh, speaker, Madam Miss Jotsna uh, Sitling, keynote speaker for this session, to please open the session. It's up. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, we have a great uh, dais uh, of Miss Ekta Kapoor, Sri Sudhir Das Ji, Dr. Virendra Raturi Ji, and uh, Murali Ji. Uh, you, you all will be, it's great to have with you all. And yes, uh, this afternoon session, right ha after having food, uh, becomes quite uh, difficult. But we'll try our level best to make this interesting. And uh, what I would like to, uh, uh, in terms of uh, now, uh, whatever deliberation we could hear since yesterday, I was uh, in the previous session, very interesting, very uh, thought provoking. Uh, at the same time, uh, the institutional dynamics of green entrepreneurship for a global ESG effect. This is, uh, I think, uh, I would like to c cover the part which uh, I had a very, uh, 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 what I can say is a very, uh, an overall uh, get to know from the other speakers also. But at the same time, uh, we, I think, will present a very diverse uh, view on this one. It will be very good. Now, coming to the analysis part of institutions, processes, systems, and stakeholder participation in it, I would like to look into that. And from uh, the CMA point of view, I think it's very important now, when we talk of green financing, uh, it is very important that we need to uh, look into how uh, we uh, uh, looked in look into the process and systems of operationalizing it on the ground next acha sorry so this is uh, what i would not uh, acha this is i need to be with this only yeah so i would not be uh, very much on uh, this one i'll mostly I'll mostly focus on commons. Uh, this is air, water, biodiversity, climate, trade, and all. I'm not going into what is environmental entrepreneurship, green. Uh, uh, I think it has been discussed much. Now coming to uh, the problem, I think it's very, very urgent for all of us to uh, have, uh, you know, this is problem itself is such that we need to 
bridge with the people now it's very very important for all of us so uh, the question becomes you know when we think people you know some in the whole game can culprits be the custodians and what about sustaining the initiative so this is also one big question we need to answer ourselves and it's time to recognize myriads of uh, innovative uh, action and social and institutional innovation just uh, excuse me just for a while yes it's working yeah so now uh, uh, i think this social innovation is very very important for all of us to uh, you know look into and what does it need it needs public disciplining on access and benefit sharing this is also very important when we talk of commons so environmental leader with mass following they have harnessed social goods and services so they have already proven basically through social innovations localized action with globalized global sensation like chipko in the north apico in the south and uh, uh, this one there is a lot of Uh, you know uh, i think it happens trade off happens in dealing with commons and listening to the public will become inevitable if we want to uh, you know have our investment uh, get impact from the investment done whatever in whichever form so let me ha huh. so the way to involve people in any green initiative i think it's very very important uh, you know are we doing a ferry service or uh, we are building the bridge instead that it needs a great amount of social engineering so this is very very important now this is the time we need to focus on here and the Uh, now lot of thing w- which we are done even on csr and all it's d- done on solution driven principle yeah there is a problem and this is the solution we are giving this solution is it going fine with them or not that we do normally the assessments but it's i, I think it's a time to focus on solving local problems because we need to attain the uh, local problems with local solutions then understand and co build this solution is very important to sustain any initiative at the same time uh, like uh, you know the intellectual people like us we are very good uh, and we have expertise in hard coding our decision making but we need to right now we need to question ourselves that you know you know is it right thing to do always or we need to hard code information generation and information sharing with the people this is very important because we have to evolve system with the people we have to sustain because is the people who will sustain the project fund will not sustain so this is important for this i think it's very important to demystify environmental indicators everything has to be bottom up ownership to the public better compliance and cost reduction happens in audit also and of course with better compliance we'll get the value of the money we which uh, you know uh, which will be invested now the main question and the main motto in doing all this is equi- inclusion diversity and equity this we need to attain in all these exercises so uh, designing green projects for global esg effect i think is very important now i'll come to the as i so said that i'll be focusing on systems and processes so in terms of systems and processes now it is very important we need to have an overall outcome and impact timeline so this is something uh, you know uh, most of the project we have seen in environmental projects it has got long gestations lot of behavioral things come you know in the transaction so it's not very easy it's quite complex so given that it's very important for us to know the impact and the outcome and maybe i i have project for 9 years but my impact is coming only after 20 years 
then I need to be upfront and telling that my impact will be seen this month provided this, this, this. You know, assumptions are made between my project finish and the, in the time the impact is created. Lot of, uh, you know, policy processes, lot of uh, other ecosystem factors, they, they will be affecting the impact of the project. Now, uh, what I could see, you know, apart from being a practitioner to now into, you know, mostly into the policy arena and, uh, and looking into <coughs> the, a clear, <coughs> there is, in many of the project which is funded, there is not a, not a clear pre-project time and fund. This is very, very important to, to you know, plan better and prepare pay people first. Then only we'll be able to, you know, take people along in the project process to give desired results. And now monitoring and evaluation, normally it's, you know, you keep a fund for monitoring and evaluation. So, but what about the knowledge management? As I told that, we are very good at, uh, you know, codifying how monitoring and evaluation should be done. But we are not good at codifying how information need to be garnered from our clients, basically, and how it needs to be disseminated to them. You know, you, you challenge them with, or you, you know, they will challenge you. It has to be a two-way learning process. Then only we'll be able to make an impact. So that is important. So knowledge management fund has to be a part of the, all these environmental projects. And along with what I told, pre-project implementation fund up there in second bullet. Now need to keep a clear provision for exit protocol. What I could see was that, you know, before the project finishes off, at least uh, if it's an eight-year project, at least two years before we should start whatever we have gathered with the people in terms of processes, systems for, you know, sustainability, it need to be strengthened more to take to, to get a, you know, get a higher leap organized to sustain the project. That is the exit protocol. Uh, any project need to have a very clear exit protocol. And at the same time, uh, you know, being flexible to evolve. Social environmental projects, uh, it's very important because overall project outcome and KPIs, key performance indicator, it's good to set to start a project. But at the same time, it's not a, you know, it's not a codified thing because, you know, things change on and on when we work with the people. So getting that, you know, by midterm, we'll able to be concretely realizing, oh, yes, this is the way to go about it in this project. And at the same time, in the midterm now, budget needs to be, again, you know, reviewed, reallocated to get the project organized for the end term and along with, you know, a, a good provision for uh, handling the withdrawal protocol. So that is very, very important. Now, at the same time, now coming to the, uh, you know, processes, systems, and how you operationalize in the project, uh, you know, domain. Now, a collaborative ecosystem, we all know it's very important. Now, uh, for, to foster a collaborative relationship, government with, you know, lot of government has, can either act as a facilitator, can act as a regulator, can act even as a market participant. Government has a great role. So we know, you know, as we move, how we move on, basically. Corporate sector, yes. I need not tell because a lot of discussion has gone over the last two days. Civil society organization have major role to play. And there is, you know, th this is the sector which has been largely not used for, uh, you know, developing uh, social sector. So this is very, very important. Social means creating, creating social ambience for envi environment to create its, you know, multiplier effect. That is very important. Now capital market, we all know. So we, I, I will not go. And knowledge institutions play a very important role because, uh, you know, most of the products and services which environment sector demand is now needs to be, you know, we have to be always creating what is the upmarket selling point for this, basically. So a great amount of research has to go 
on and on with all this initiative if, if especially if we want to take good practices to a better policy arena to get a larger impact organized. So this is uh, one part. So why important to consult people? So I'm just going to all this we all know. This is the defeat livelihood framework. Now fifth part has also come intellectual capital. I'm not including that. I'm including say for it's coming under human capital only. So basically what is now it's not only village, everywhere household. You know, the thought basic unit of economic processes household. How they decide will depend, you know, how the, uh, the whole ecosystem will develop, basically. So when we, you know, when we go for a, with a solution driven principle, what we miss is that, you know, in, throughout the project process, uh, what happens is lot of context change, vulnerability context. There must be shocks, you know, there is seasonality factor like what's happening in Shimla. Trends is climate change is always a trend, you know, it keeps on, and changes keeps on happening basically. So all these affects the capital, all these five type of capital. Now given that all these are always in a flux, they are, you know, acting, working, whatever. Now government creates policies, institutions and processes that you know, keeps on in a flux influencing each other basically. And at the same time, it will, you know, when there is a vulnerability context, government can act whatever in institutions, processes, all these Samaj, Bazaar, Sarkar, they are the institutions in between. Yeah? And processes, they, how they act, why they act are these processes. Now people develop their livelihood strategies and outcomes basically. Again, this outcome will get into this, that's how the people make decision. So if we hear people, we know how to maneuver our project to create an impact. This, you know, otherwise we'll not. We'll think that whatever we are giving, they are, it's good for them and, you know, we'll, we'll create a very good report also, but that will not show any impact. So this is very important. Now, why this is very important to the, in today's context is, Normally, this social, human, physical, and financial capital are transformed by policies, processes, and institutions into desirable and undesirable, whatever, living style, whatever, you know, livelihoods, that ultimately decides sustainability of natural capital. So natural capital for us is very, very important right now. This is what uh, we feel. And now, attention to funders also. This is very important. We have to be, you know, funding into transformative impact through green enterprises. So, uh, you know, until and unless I'm coming to the design, deployment, management, and measurement of impact part right now. So, it is the end user community, you know, when we go and develop, you know, if a social entrepreneur goes, First, his job is to listen to the end user and understand the overall project need. It's not necessary that he need to accept that in the first listening part. Secondly, consulting and engaging. Uh, implementation agency with community. So this is very important, community, implementation agency, whichever does work, you know, even the funders, whichever, they need to go to influence the design and delivery of intervention. It's very important to let the people, you know, give their feedback for design and delivery of intervention to develop norm for engaging. We have to engage people from the beginning of the project. So that's why it's very important to consult and engage with people. At the same time, now comes the third part towards midterm and all. So co-design and co-produce. Now implementing agency and community need to be consulted and now co-designing and co-producing part comes. Why produce? We are not giving. We are now generating to sustain. So co-production part need to be integrated, ingrained within the project process. Then only it will create impact. So it's equipped. Sir, uh, it's written NPOs, you can say implementing agency for co-producing products and services of any or any further intervention. Now exit protocol as I told, community and stakeholder to bring out systemic support into ecosystem player, to ecosystem players. Apart from, 
you know this this project uh, primary stakeholders there are many more stakeholders where i showed in that pancha you know in five uh, diagram from within and outside for sustainability then only the project will sustain so this is you know keeping sustainability at the crux of thing how you design the project and how you implement the project and how you involve people across the project process to get the uh, uh, you know to get the desired result organized now here it's become very important normally what happens is that anyone with fund goes to the field and forms a certain committee and they start performing it's very important for people you form it but it's a, like a gila mitti they you know we have to subject them to storming it's very important to you know you know battle and settle the ground before you perform then only then comes the community will form their own norm with you know implementing agency with the funders with whatever and then they will start performing and it, that performance will be the real performance otherwise not so this is how i i just would like to uh, now how socially address the environmental problem with people reflect on my own leadership as a change maker now it's all you know we all are in a soup basically our individual leadership how we use the resources from moment to moment matters you know matters uh, for sustaining the earth basically and recognize leader from uh, civil society organization from from the you know many many other uh, organizations like uh, gram panchayat civic bodies obviously market you know you are from market end but you are the leader here yeah and now sarkar sarkar is person like me the type you know and now some example of global effect from public systems these are my own uh, so how to go to the wo oh, can you please hit wo oh, board nahi hai na how to click this dun wali initiative it will open up can anyone do the the button is not here i'll just show uh, quickly uh, you know the how uh, participatory uh, participatory action would uh, you know lead to sustainable change with few examples which i have done in the field and uh, you know just to uh, uh, briefly nahi ho payega pardon pardon now i'll just tell ha huh? here it is an eu funded project where 90% of funding grant was uh, from uh, you, uh, and we had 300 three villages in dun valley area we all know dun valley was ravaged by limestone quarrying in 1982 supreme court or uh, you know had a stricture done that there will not be any mining but uh, the you know it was totally ravaged so given that now uh, with this funding which came in 1993 we started working and i was there from 95 to 2001 so main thing here we did was participatory approach to getting the usme dun valley likha hoga usko click kar do bas link nahi ho pa raha aap aap log ha ye aap dekhenge ye ye iska kaun sa button hai usko dikh ye ye dekhenge ye pehle is level par tha zameen ये इस तरह से रावेज होके रखा है हा? और क्या है कि जस्ट सो बेसिकली एंड ये क्या है कि ये देखेंगे इतने महिलाओं में ड्रजरी है कि ये बच्चा को कुत्ता के साथ बांध के महिला घास लेने के लिए गई है दिन के टाइम में हा सो हाउ यू नो द एनवायरमेंट इफेक्ट दी थिंग नाउ नाउ इट आई आई कैन ऑपरेट सो दिस इज हाउ ना ना इट्स ओके नाउ इट्स डन so now this is how uh, uh, this is just uh, you know working with the people we had organized some uh, uh, the project cost uh, in uh, this was in third and uh, 23.7 uh, uh, million euro so uh, given that uh, you know uh, 
getting the stake of the people organized is very important. So apart from, although that was area was rabbit, people were poor, but still we had kept the component of Angsadan and Sramdan. This is very important. People need to be included. This will bring, you know, because we don't have money. From morning we are, uh, you know, hearing. And if someone is giving and they are giving at a very high cost, basically, whatever. So we have to stand on our own feet. This is the time. And this is the only way to move forward to handle uh, our environmental problems. So this was, now after that, what we did was that, you know, 10 years withdrawal plan. After project has left, but after, even after project leaves, you know, after 10 years from now, how you will handle, there was a concrete plan. And I will show you then, you know, but, you know, a lot of social, uh, you know, you need to use a lot of tools uh, to, you know, mobilize people. So it's very, very important. Uh, this, uh, apart from whatever we have done, I'm just coming to the next. Here, this voluntary eco-restoration work, we had raised an avian called Dala Lagawa Gautai Bachawa. Because when I went to these villages, it used to be, you know, seen that most of the villagers in many villages, they didn't sleep in their villages. They slept elsewhere during rainy season because they used to tell us that we will be swept away at night. That was the situation. Then we told them, we have got very little fund, but you have to come forward to save your own village. What we should do? So this is how the, you know, the negotiation goes on and on with the people. So given that 10,000, over the period of five years, 10,813 members, they planted 3.5, 3.55 eight cutting saplings to treat 358 strategic erosion prone locations in the Dune Valley area without a single government penny. Whatever uh, our pay were going, you know, to the project people, that was 5% given by, uh, you know, government of Uttarakhand. So given that now this project has you innovatively used the local culture, local knowledge and local initiative for eco restoration for self-help. It's very important. Upscaling the exercise for community ownership. Now I'll just, just flip through. See, this is, they used to give pran with one mutti mitti. Yes, I'll devote one day for my village to prevent my, you know, to do plantation. So this is the oath taking ceremony uh, given by, you know, village to village, 82 villages. So this is something technical training going on that, you know, whenever we do cutting in the erosion prone area, what, what should be the mota and all these technical trainings are given. So now it's, it's all, you can see their cultural, why I'm telling cultural part is there, you can see there is Dhol Damao, there's Mandir, you know, every, Every village, they used to, on that day, they used to do puja at the top of the mountain area and they used to go for doing plantation in all the strategic ero erosion prone areas. So this is how people have contributed on their own. So you can see the type of area people are doing the work, yeah? And even there was a great jubilation after the Sramdan. So even the community kitchen of that day, they used to pay their own, you know, they used to raise their own fund and uh, do this. Why I'm showing all this is, this has a very larger impact in terms of sustaining the project. Say so other initiative, you know, a lot of other initiative, I'm not going to go into details. Like this one, they used to take uh, 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 trees and get, get the, uh, that uh, whole, you know, the uh, stage organized for marriage. So given that instead we attack that culture with planting one tree, then I ask them, you are planting one tree, but you are cutting four trees. Can we take another, can we do some, you know, uh, can we hire the, uh, you know, that uh, altar where the bride and groom sits uh, from outside? So they brought another structure and they, this prevented uh, cutting trees. And especially during weddings and all, you can see how they stay in a line, no? in Pangat, they call. You know, these type of thing gets, you know, immediately transferred in the social, uh, you know, as a message, basically. These are different, I'm not going. These are four years plantation, I'm just not very. 
Now, you know, how you address the sustainability part within the project process, I'm giving the example. Developing stake of the community, and now year-wise scaling up of contribution of the stakeholder in large tank, canals, and harvesting tank. You know, relatively, well, of people will take this tank. So yes, I'm paying 38,000 rupees. You know, can we, can you, it all, you know, it's a market that needs to operate with people also. It's a, it's a grand project, but you know, can we raise the own fund to sustain the initiative after the project? That is very, very important. Now, canals, you can see, you know, how the fund has been raised to uh, first uh, one kilometer canal, Pachis by Chalis Uska, so 3.3 .3 lakh was there. So there, you know, they raised 40, then, you know, there used to be four, six, seven stakeholders. So 30 to 40,000 they raised, and this harvesting tank also. At the same time, the common property like stone, check them and all, we did not raise any because it was the, in the common land. But afterwards, like 120, 120 rupees, this type of stuff. Basically, even with the grant fund, you know, the market system need to operate on the ground to sustain the project, you know, for developing the stake of the stakeholders to sustain the project, basically. Now, I'll, you know, the result of all this Ramdan and Angsadan, I could show. In 10 villages, this is the fund, the project different components we had, forestry, livestock, horticulture, minor irrigation, agriculture, all directed towards conservation of Dune Valley, Ravage Dune Valley. Huh? Now, you can see in forestry, the maximum investment had gone, okay, livestock, after that, a second was in minor irrigation, you can see, okay, and third one was in soil conservation. Now, in the exit protocol, when we made 10 years plan, so I will just give you how the, the change. The forestry, which had gone largest investment, now they have gained relatively lesser amount. Minor irrigation, they have kept, uh, uh, so this one, uh, uh, sorry, I think it got just reverted, huh? sorry. This is the first slide, this contribution raised from the different components. Uh, no, it's not, uh, that was the investment done and raised contribution. See, why market operate, I'm telling that you can see, just to, you know, it, it's a great uh, case study basically. So this is the minor irrigation. You know, they have raised maximum amount from minor irrigation. Forestry, even though they had done very, you know, spent lot of money, less because it was common property resource. Now, livestock also, it's a, you know, they have raised quite a good amount of fund. They had raised 23 lakhs when we had spent 2.1 crores out of that, okay? So now, you can see the distribution. And now, utilization in the re of revolving fund of Gram Resource Management Association means that village committee in sample of 10 villages is the same one. Now, how they are spending money in their withdrawal plan? for 10 years to come after the project, it is this basically. So, so this is something like they have, you know, spend, they will spend lot of money in forest, looking after forestry, because from here they draw the water. Harnessing of water takes from the forest. And only harvesting path is minor irrigation. So they have le put lesser amount because this is a private asset they can handle on their own also. And at the same time, institution development, they see how much amount they have put for next 10 years, yeah? So this is how, you know, we need to be on and on. We need to sense the pulse of the people to get the sustainability agenda organized on the ground. All this, with all this, I just wanted to mention that one. So another, just another example, um, I'll, I'm not going to give presentation, but I'll just cite. Another, uh, you just come, Come back, please. The another one. Madam, so I'll just. Madam, one second, with yeah. your permission. Uh, this is Papan Bai, Padmanavan chairman. Um, our friends, people have gone to receive the honorable minister. So he might come uh, with uh, due respect, everybody. He might come by 4 p.m. He might. So I'll stop here. No, no, no madam, problem. wait now. Nah. I'm just uh, announcing. Okay, okay. Not to you, or to uh -huh. all. Uh -huh. So by any chance. By any chance, we'll continue the session. By any chance, Minister comes, sir, and Madam also. We will plan accordingly that the thing so that 
it should not be embarrassing for you. I should tell in advance. That is why. So you can do some time management, madam, because the three more speakers are there. Fine. So question and answer, I have already told them in the beginning. Let us finish the session after that question, so that we will be sharing the email ID and this thing of all the eminent speakers. So you can ask questions uh, later on also. But little bit we have to adjust with uh, when ministers are coming. If at all they come. Because he has promised us he will come and he will come also. Right? Do you have any idea? So, madam, uh, you please continue. But uh, three more speakers yeah, are there. Uh, to all of you, I am just. Five minutes. So, uh, we'll, huh? this is my humble request. Let me because just take time. five minutes now. Thank you. Thank yeah? you, madam. Sorry. Thank you. Me. Thanks a lot. So, this is something, is another uh, one. Why we need to look into livelihood concerns in conservation realities. Yeah? So, this is also. This is uh, of uh, huh. what had happened. I'll just tell you the story basically. You can see this one uh, without taking this Valley of Flower National Park and Nanda Devi National Park. These two, uh, I had gone there as a director of the park and I had to manage these two national parks and two national parks. But at the same time, now this, both these national parks have different, uh, you know, uh, conservation conflict. Nanda Devi National Park, there was you know, there was 20 years of rife between park and public because of the, uh, you know, uh, strict conservation regime, yeah. And this Valley of Flower National Park, there was laxity in the conservation because, uh, you know, that Hemkund Sahib is the same way where you go to Valley of Flower and Hemkund Sahib. So, it was really, uh, 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 you know, lot of garbage had been deposited there. So, you know how people were engaged to sustain this project, I am just going to tell basically. And it is sustaining till now. So, because we had involved people in 2004-05. So, this is how, uh, uh, yeah, I am not going, this is different maps. So, this I already told that people were on rife from 83 to 2003 uh, for this. Uh, Nanda Devi National Park because it was stopped from mountaineering activity, then uh, people will wheel away of the livelihood opportunities. And Valley of Flower National Park, 4 to 6 lakh pilgrim in 5 point in 19 kilometer route in uh, this Hemkun Sahib. And the bio resources were very highly depleted. Vi Valley of Flower National Park had the potential of becoming world heritage site, but no management on the ground to affect this. Especially international visitors went with a very bad note about the valley. So, given that I am not going to do all this part, NDBR part. Now, uh, we what we did was that this is whole biosphere reserve. I am just uh, telling about only the two parks basically. Now, what we did was that, that we negotiated with the people to open up the this uh, uh, value of uh, this Nanda Devi National Park up to. Uh, 10 kilometers uh, from uh, 10 kilometers where they could see the park, beautiful park, Bolsev Park inside. So, 500 visitors were allowed. But at the same time, you know, it took a lot of time to talk with the people. Earlier, they were porters and guides 20 years back. But to make them as destination developers, lot of, you know, mindset change. Lot of capacity building had to go. So, that is why I am telling we have to be on with the people on the ground. Then only we will be able to understand. And some, some four villages, one village was telling that we will be, you know, handling the whole mountaineering activity. Then we had to develop a special, you know, mountaineering circuit in that one. How, you know, every village get equal opportunity to uh, get access to this uh, tourism activities. Now, in Valley of Flower National Park, so, here also we use Sramdan and we told villagers that there were 400, uh, you know, shops in that 19 kilometers route, but without, uh, you know, lot of garbage. And uh, now, we, uh, 76 family, we talk with them, we tell them you will have only one shop per village now. And at the same time now, because we, there also we prove them with economic sense. Humne ye bola. अभी तुम क्या है ना सीजन में 10 जगह दुकान डाल देते हो सबलेट कर देते हो कोई मेरठ से आया दिल्ली से आया दुकान रखने दे रहे हो अब ये दुकान तुम खुद ही चलाओ और तुम जिम्मेदारी ले लो यहां का तो ये बहुत अच्छा चल जाएगा और तुम प्रॉफिट तो तुम्हारे हाथ में आएगा सब वो 
then economic sense there also so it's very very important to create economic sense in conservation with the people now had this and at the same time their jila parishad used to take tax which was illegal so when we uh, so all this when we uh, you know uh, develop uh, uh, when we uh, and we again there was eco fee angsadan you know for keeping shop can you depending on the size of the shop keep you know pay 1500 rupees and 2500 rupees per year so they agreed so given all those so this is what it shows that you know eco fee uh, eco fee they collected at the same time what happened was they when they you know we uh, using shramdan we collected about 50 tons of garbage there and at the same time now you know it was very difficult to uh, uh, sell that garbage i'll tell a story in very brief basically and what happened was that ultimately a buyer from delhi was ready but he told that you bring that money that you know 50 tons of garbage to dehradun i'll pay 3 sorry 30000 rupees only but the carting from that place about 270 uh, km till dehradun it cost us 98000 rupees this is the environment cost we are paying so we didn't leave at that we brought all the garbage to dehradun we sorted the garbage did post consumer analysis of plastic waste and shown to the government that you know one one to manage one kg of garbage it's costing 53 rupees per kg government understood took immediate action lot of policies followed government invested in installing plastic densification plant in the in the de destination where my 15 kg plastic could become only half a truck so there are also economic sense principles what happens is that if the cost is coming down if i have plastic densification plant in the destination so you know much of the economy trickle down to rack pickers because they, because of the lesser overhead cost so that way it will galvanize the economy of rack picking there only so this is very very important for our us to understand you know when we work with the people and you know do our work basically so this is something like you know the sustainability aspect i am just ex explaining then uh, uh, you know after having all that we seeing no fund we uh, went to the government and told that you know if uh, that gora khachar takes 200 rupees to go from govin ghat to hemkund the 20 rupees which jila parishad was taking if it's giving to the given to the eco development committee which is managing everything government agreed issued one geo then we you know then you know, in the first year itself they collected fund to the tune of uh, you can see and uh, 9.8 lakh rupees and uh, plus whatever community had contributed is 10.42 lakh rupees so this is how now they have been you know i don't have uh, after 20 but i have got but i could not get uh, time uh, to you know put this one uh, but still there now uh, learning from the process change with local stakeholder so i have already told i am not going to you can see the i am just taking you the file photos this how we mobilize the community you can see maila mangal dal in the fourth slide in 2003 cleaning campaign this was me and people are listening you know we have to be be on with them so this is how the people are taking their after we can hemkund was full of garbage yeah this 50 ton this is one one cement bag you can see yeah this is this is being taken to dehradun 15 truck loads so this is how the local people have been engaged to you know get the uh, nature tourism organized building their capacity hai na so people in ghagaria they they uh, kya na they remain idle through tourists now the slide shows are going on people take money from that so this is how we analyze the plastic waste to to you know to show to the government basically so research work also had to go on and on as i told with this support uh, uh, then we developed the guideline for mountaineering and uh, uttarakhand is only one state which has developed a very concrete guideline uh, this environmental guideline for mountaineering so yeah this is uh, how this whole garbage dump was you know converted into a world heritage site the valley of flowers national park yeah so this is how the local effect from local to global basically so 
this UNESCO recognized and to in 2005, they gave world heritage status to Valley of Flowers National Park. So everything is related. People, the stakeholder from local to go global, they now recognize, you know, environmental impact. So this is very important. So uh, I'm not going to going much now. Lot of uh, innovation, I, uh, we could get lot of, uh, you know, support from the government to experiment effective program convergence, best practices were documented very thoroughly for immediate follow-up and policy support. Policy research work of high quality went hand in hand with innovative community involvement strategy. That's how we could uh, do all these basically. Thank you very much. So my purpose was just to show, you know, how policy, how the community dynamic works in the, in the environmental, you know, to, if you are, are to handle environment in a cost effective manner and sustain it, that is more important. It's only community, it's only localization they can sustain. We cannot sustain. So we have to pay attention to that. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Yeah. So now may I request no, no, our uh, next speaker for this session, madam, uh, Ms. Ekta Kumar, independent ESG and CSR advisor, to please present her perspective. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. This is uh, uh, actually a very uh, rigorous follow-up by Dr. S.K. Gupta Ji. So thank you, Gupta Ji, for you know that follow-up and having me here. I've been around for just today, and I've learned so much in the process. And I hope that after my session, you also know something about what happens in the corporate world in terms of ESG. Uh, so broadly, just to begin with a little bit of a background about myself and Sustainable Edge, the organization that I've founded. I've spent 23 years in the corporate world. My last job till 22, uh, 2022 was with Samsung. I was the ESG head for India and Southwest Asia. Prior to that, I was with Shell, Airtel, Deloitte, ICICI Bank. I've done the, I've tried to cover as many industries as I could in my corporate career. Uh, today, as Sustainable Edge, the intent is really, you know, to bring up more awareness about what is ESG and CSR. Uh, so there is a lot of capacity building work that I do, and also to help organizations drive their ESG compliances. And India, especially, as we know that BRSR reporting is becoming very critical, so that is one space that I work a lot in. Moving on, uh, what I'm going to talk about in today's session is uh, as the technical session says, we talk about green entrepreneurship and we look at the local linkages to it, as in how is the entire global world and the local world linked to green entrepreneurship, what's the interconnectedness over there. So beginning with what is green entrepreneurship, I think it needs no introduction. You are in a global summit that is talking about, you know, um, how to go green, how to, you know, kind of develop green entrepreneurship. Uh, just kind of this picture might help you understand that today we all look at every aspect of life in terms of how it can be more sustainable. There was a time when corporates used to get investors by saying that I make the most profits, I make the best product, I do this, I do that. Today that story has changed quite a bit. The story today is I am profitable, I make the best products and I am sustainable. If you're not able to say that I am sustainable, you won't get investors, you won't get employees, you won't get customers. So the whole paradigm is shifting today. So green entrepreneurship is basically about making more sustainable products as well as having more sustainable businesses. Some examples that we can look at, like for example, Tesla is a very good example of being an absolutely sustainable organization as in they are one of those organizations that make more money by selling carbon credits than actually by selling cars, right? 
so they are into a product line that helps them share with the world that they don't have a carbon footprint at all and they are helping you know uh, arrest the climate crisis that we are all facing right now google similarly invests a lot in technology they have some of the highest number of investments in renewable energy uh, last that i read was in 2022 they had already invested dollar 3.5 billion into renewable energy all their data centers are powered by renewable energy and wherever they can't be they try and do offsets that means they power something else with renewable energy so that whatever they are not consuming somebody else's and they take the credit for that uh, i'm talking of some smaller organizations also over here so that we understand that green entrepreneurship is a wide spectrum not just the big players so it's like chakra innovation i had the pleasure of meeting the team um, they came and made a presentation to me when i was working with shell and at that point of time they shared their product which was basically capturing the carbon that comes out of diesel gensets by a small gadget and whatever carbon gets collected then gets used as ink so the ink that we write with that black suit is used to kind of write and it is refilled in pens so they are really bringing to life the concept of circularity that nothing is wasted whatever is waste is again leveraged as ink in the pens and last but not the least haskpar again had the pleasure of working with them um, so they work with uh, you know husk which is basically uh, that comes out from paddy fields from rice they use that to make uh, gas for areas where you can do not have electricity so the gas makes electricity then so wherever we have villages which are still not connected with the main grids husk power is the way to get energy or electricity in those villages again a very sustainable and a green initiative moving on let's talk about the global dimensions of esg so we've seen what a green uh you know company could look like now let's talk about what esg has been or what has the journey of esg reporting been in india so it started as you know long back as 2009 although it's becoming a buzzword more now um uh, and then in 2012 actually sebi mandated that you have to do the brr reporting and from brr reporting it's been a journey till 2021 with you know 100 companies and then 500 companies and 1000 companies and so on and so forth but in 2021 it got rebranded as brsr and today as we all know is business responsibility and sustainability reporting that the top 1000 companies as per market capitalization are supposed to do it in fact as i speak today two days back sebi came out with another brsr format called brsr core so this is brsr comprehensive that came out in 2021 which was approximately 140 parameters that the companies had to comply to now they've come up with an even shorter list of 49 parameters two days back saying that you know we'd like companies to start following this brsr code and comply to these small 49 parameters but makes it more comparable across companies as to how they are doing in terms of their esg practices so how is brsr aligned to the esg pillars pretty straight forward as in they've really nailed it they've got nine principles where they talk to all of the pillars from an environment perspective they talk to it you know talked about what is your energy strategy do, how much is your greenhouse gas emissions what is your renewable energy strategy solid waste management water consumption reduce recycle all these practices the 3r as we know them sustainable sourcing etc from a social perspective it is generally you know all stakeholders that you can think of so first is the employees it is about how are you taking care of well being of your own employees then second is the community where you have your plants your factories how are you taking care of them what are you doing for them how to have the social license to operate and last but not the least also looking at human rights and other aspects the last one is of course governance that is not new to us and i'm sure as uh, you know cost and management accountants that's something that you're very aware of so i will kind of give that a skip now the esg compliance or the brsr you know advantage there are way too many of them as in i'm going to go through them very briefly we are all aware that you know being sustainable could mean a little bit of a cost initially but at the, in the long run it pays off and in fact there is data in around this increased value creation msci has shown 
that you know over a 12 year period organizations that have been more sustainable have created more value than those that haven't been sustainable likewise access to markets and increased market share i shared that initially as well employees don't want to join you if you are not sustainable investors don't want to invest in you if you're not sustainable so it's kind of become the thing that you have to do moving on increased access to capital um, obviously again as i said that you know when when we are looking at green finance there was a session before this that talk about you know spoke about uh, green bonds green financing rbi's new regulations so that is exactly what the benefit of being more sustainable is that you get access to these funds uh, reduced financial risk so i was incidentally uh, very taken aback by this particular aspect when i was working in 2019 with again uh, shell which is an oil and gas company world bank said that they will stop investing in oil and gas sector upstream of that you know sector that means no more oil uh, exploration and refining so that means that the organizations that like world bank that are going to give you funds are getting so stringent about it there is a wake up call over there to say that okay let's look at other sources of energy like renewable energy rather than looking at oil as a source of energy then obtaining social license to operate it's a no brainer it is not the government that gives you an license to operate any day the community around you can come and do a strike outside your premises if you are not socially responsible so it's very very important to be socially responsible in your practices and last but not the least attracting and retaining talent as an employee especially the gen z the millennials are extremely conscious about sustainability and you can only retain them if you're a sustainable organization moving on to what is brsr i'm going a little bit of detail into this because this is the esg compliance for india and this is how we as an organization in india will grow in our esg responsibilities and in our esg compliance so this is the format it's got a section a b and c section a is a no brainer which is you know size of your company turnover products employees etc section b is what are the management processes over there and last but not the least section c which has the 140 parameters in it talks of two indicators to begin with they're saying let's look at essential indicators that means a must have that means your employees must have an insurance your employees must you know there must be a code of conduct a human rights policy etc but then there are certain others which they have put in as leadership indicators which says that you grow into it if you don't have it today then also it's okay but at least please ensure that as an organization you're working towards it these are the nine principles that they talk about i'm not going to go through all nine of them but if you give a quick glance to it you will understand that it talks about you know human rights it talks about well being of employees it talks about being responsive towards all stakeholders it talks about being responsible towards the environment equitable development so they've covered all bases through these nine principles now let's talk about the interconnectedness as in why is india should we really bother right as in there are many conversations also that you know the global south the developing nations still have a lot more to do than to start worrying about sustainability right we've got to get a lot of things you know to get our house in order so this should not perhaps be a priority but it's an interconnected world right we don't live in isolation we are working with some of the global players and hence it's very important to understand that what you do at a local level at the end of the day becomes like a south east asia or a asia thing and then it becomes a global thing and it's it's all very interconnected so i for example was advising an organization recently on their esg uh, journey and there were many gaps there was a lot that they needed to do but they were very excited about it they were like yeah yeah please tell us what more we'll do it and i kept stating it up front that uh, while i see and sense the excitement i do hope that this is going to be a lot of cost for all of you as in there's a lot of investment of time effort and money that's going to go into you know being more sustainable they said that's not a problem we have a customer in europe who will give us 3% extra if we do this well so that just goes to show that everybody has figured it out that they're a part of the global economy and they need to do it well to get more money from their customers as well right so i'm just going to quickly conclude by sharing that how does 
some of our ESG frameworks compared to the international ESG frameworks. Um, this is a quick comparison with the GRI standards and if you'd like to see more, I've given the link down below for you to go and you know, evaluate it better. But as you can see, there's a mapping of everything that the global world has already been following in our BRSR reporting as well. Likewise, there's an interconnectedness of our BRSR with the SDGs as well, which is the Sustainable Development Goals. So the Business Responsibility and Sustainability Report has a complete overlap with the SDGs as well. I think to conclude, I'll just say, as in bringing us back to the whole thing that it's all an interconnected world, the apparel industry is perhaps the best example over here. As you might be aware, India, China, Bangladesh are some of the hubs for the European you know, companies for sourcing both their cloth as well as the ready-made apparels. And the entire apparel industry is falling in line. First, it was the human rights revolution where child labor, etc., got restricted because everybody came to know about it, that Marks and Sensor and H&M and all these guys were getting things made and child labor was being put into it. Now it's becoming about sustainable and ethical you know, practices. And everybody has got their eyes on this industry. And this industry is really shaped up so well over the past couple of years where they've got these sustainability practices going on. They are very, very ethical in their practices. And I think that just shows that it's not a choice anymore. If you want a buyer who is outside of India, you will have to fall in line with ESG practices, become more sustainable. And that's the way forward for all of us. That is all that I have for today. Thank you so much for being such a great audience. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your insights with us. Now may I request uh, our next speaker uh, for this session, Sri Sudipta Dasti, partner Future Station ESG, to share his insights. Sir. Both are working. Good afternoon. <clears throat> so while, uh, okay, <clears throat> so while uh, <clears throat> for the last two days, I mean today and yesterday, we have heard about, uh, I'm sorry, give me a second. Is it on? It's on, huh? So we have heard about uh, a lot of uh, <clears throat> regulations, a lot of activities, a lot of you know uh, changes happening uh, in the way we work. Okay, in the way we work in uh, the government, in the way we work in the private sector, in the way we work in the public sector, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the session is about uh, global and local dimensions. So. I thought I'll share with uh, all of you, instead of global, maybe focus towards European dimensions, because as we all know, Europe is where essentially all these uh, initiatives started, and they are still leading uh, worldwide about, uh, about uh, all the initiatives, yeah. So typically, as you know, all the initiatives in the area of uh, ESG, or we used to call it sustainability in good old times, they used to start, and still now they, they start from the Scandinavian countries, and then they go south to Europe, and then all over the world. So I would like to discuss about uh, a bit of what we see, uh, and what I have seen in the last uh, maybe 25 or maybe 30 years of working in the area of sustainability. Uh, I'm sure 
many people may not have worked for 30 years in the area of sustainability, but unfortunately, uh, that was the work that I used to do. And I've seen the way things are changing. And so I'll pick up a few of the things which we see in uh, Europe, happening in Europe, and typically for the private sector, because I worked all my life in the private sector, even today working with the private sector. So pardon my uh, lack of knowledge about the other sectors, about uh, things that you know Indian corporates, and I'm sure uh, <coughs> a lot of you uh, could be associated with uh, Indian uh, corporate sector. So maybe you might, you might find uh, things resonating. So <coughs> just to summarize, what does ESG mean? OK, we know about, uh, we've heard about many regulations. We've heard about uh, many terms. But in simple word, ESG, what it means for an organization is commitment to accountability at the highest level. So I'm talking to people who know it better than anyone else. Commitment to reduce environmental footprint. Commitment to fulfill social responsibilities of business. And commitment towards strong business growth. So we have to keep one thing in mind, that sustainability or ESG definitely requires people to have, companies to have business growth. Profit is not a bad word. Profit is not a bad word. You know, somehow we get an idea that, OK, these companies talking about profit, so it must be bad. Let's talk only about social things. Let's talk only about charity. Let's talk only about CSR. Well, companies are not uh, going to be sustainable by doing only CSR. So they have to have economic growth. So all these four broad aspects are expected to be fulfilled uh, through ESG. Now, I'm not going to discuss, um, I think this this slide, Ekta uh, has shown this slide, uh, similar kind of slide. So these are covered. All of you know about it. But I would like to mention about two, three, few, two, three important things which are extremely important. It's, it's, it's not proper to prioritize anything of, of all these sectors because you know what, what we are still today hearing about and what we are still, we started doing, I mean, since last so many years, is we talk about certain words called materiality. Unfortunately, the, the importance of materiality is going down. Today, the stakeholders want to know everything, all of these, and maybe beyond more, beyond this. So we cannot just say that, okay, in my industry, only these, you know, two, three, ten out of these, so many factors are important, so others I can ignore. We cannot ignore, we cannot, we have to do all these, and we have to communicate our, our performance to all our stakeholders and all of these aspects. <clears throat> we have to keep in mind that ESG is something which is an evolving contemporary topic. As we speak, things change. As uh, you know, as Ekta mentioned, even two days back or three days back, uh, there's a change in our country. BRSR core assurance regulation has come from SEBI. So things are changing almost every week. I do not know. As we speak, maybe something has changed. So. It's a very, very evolving contemporary topic. We don't have any experts anywhere in the world. We are all learners. Somebody has been learning a little up the curve, somebody a little behind. But we are all learning because everything is changing. There's nothing that we learned 10 years back is true today. The KPIs, the key performance indicators of ESG are evolving. And the positions taken by the key players are changing. In the entire value system, the position taken by key players are changing. So when we talk about the particular the stakeholders, the investors, customers, and regulators are emerging as the most important stakeholders out of the entire lot of stakeholders that we are used to talking about. We talk about a whole lot of stakeholders. But really, for all practical purpose, these three are emerging in the last five, seven years as the most important stakeholders for any business. Now, uh, <clears throat> some of these things is, you know, is becoming mandatory. If we are doing business, if we are working with global organizations, if we are, we are, a supply, we are, we are supplying our goods and services to companies or you know, customers in the Western world, some of these are becoming mandatory. And if it is not 
ask for today is going to be asked for tomorrow. So you better start preparing for this, all of you. That's my request. CDP, we've heard about CDP, so I won't go to discuss about CDP. But what CDP does is very importantly, CDP has also, from this year, has started sending questionnaires to all the top 1,000 companies that BRSR is covering. So all that, if you're a part of, if you're working with any of the top 1,000 companies, uh, top 1,000 listed companies in India, I'm sure somebody in the organization must have received a query from CDP, and you better take care of that. So CDP is actually taking data on primarily environmental data, environmental performance, not the entire ESG on climate change, water security, and forestry, and preparing information primarily for the investors, but again for others also. And if, you, if somebody is not responding to CDP, it's very prominently the name comes up in the website. Everybody in the world sees that this company was asked to respond, and they have not responded. So people take their own, make their own inferences. TCFD, uh, TCFD is essentially in terms of how, and I'm talking to you know, CMAs today, how the impact of climate change, the risk and opportunity of climate change is translated into your financial numbers, as simple as that. It's so important, so important. The climate risk is so important, and today, and I have one more slide to cover that, today, most companies in India today have ERMs, Enterprise Risk Management, but hardly any company has climate risk as a part of the top 10 or top 20 risk, there is that matter. You know, we, we do not consider climate risk as a part of a business risk, which is unfortunate. Climate risk features within the top two risks anywhere in the world. So TCFD is actually demanding that we consider climate risk an opportunity in our risk management system, not as a separate risk, but as part of our integral risk management system and take appropriate action accordingly. Ecovadis, ah, fortunately I have not heard the word Ecovadis since yesterday, so nobody has covered Ecovadis. Other people have covered. So Ecovadis is a platform for supply chain, suppliers. So if we are a part of a supply chain of any global company, they would ask us to upload our ESG performance, and Ecovadis covers the entire E, S, and G, not just E, uh, on the platform, and they also give a kind of a scoring so the customers get a good idea about whom to do business with. And Ecovadis demands the way they are asking for the data from us. They demand that we ask the same data from our supply chain. So it's like you know, we are actually covering a larger population of companies through the platform of Ecovadis. GRI, of course, is a very old, uh, most popular way of communicating uh, ESG or sustainability performance. So I won't talk more about GRI. I think uh, I think today Aditi was here, right, from GRI. Though I was not here, I was not present in the earlier session. I think Aditi Halda was supposed to be here. She was there? All right. So I won't talk more about uh, GRI, because she must have spoken a lot about GRI. And ISSP is the latest one. The International Sustainability Standard Boards, they are trying to combine Everyone, integrated reporting, TCFD, GRI, they are trying to combine everything. So how much time do I have? So how much time do I have? Five more minutes? Okay, no problem. So ISSB has come out with two standards. IFRS S1 and S2, which are actually just been rolled out. So these are the things that possibly, the futuristic thing is we'll possibly have to report only as per IFRS S1 and S2 all over the world, and not all the others. And <clears throat> there's one more thing which is uh, important that there are certain independent EHG rating agencies. I will talk about SNP and MSCI, but there are many more they are actually rating the companies and, and all the investors and customers, more and more of them, and more importantly, the analysts, they are reading the ESG rating of companies and clearly 
ESG rating has an impact on the market cap. So it's, a, it's an extremely important rating. Something impacting a company's market cap is, you know, you can imagine how important it is. So ESG rating is something which has also you know, come to India. Now, a little bit about what we see in Europe. Europe, you know, uh, as compared to us, the S and G factors of performance are, I, I would think, generally pretty well taken care of. All right? So their challenges, they are focusing more on the environmental aspects. And with the E, as, e aspect also, they are focusing on climate change, carbon management, circularity, that is waste management, and biodiversity. Biodiversity is becoming very, very important every passing day. Recent regulations which are important for all of us who are doing business with Europe, just imagine CSRD, the Compulsory Sustainability Reporting Directive in Europe. So companies have to do compulsorily and they have to include the supply chain. So if you're a part of the supply chain of any European company, make sure and be sure definitely uh, a mail is going to come to you asking for your sustainability and your ESG initiatives. And if you cannot fulfill that, let me tell you a story, a small story. This I heard from a client of mine. There was this, this company who came to Bombay, invited some of the major clients, major suppliers from India uh, in, in Taj Palace, you know, lovely meeting, lovely uh, lunch. And post lunch, they were said, okay, these are the things that we want all of you guys to do. We'll come back next year, and we hope that we'll meet you here. That means if you do not do these things, you will not be invited here next year. That means you're not going to be a part of a supply chain. As simple as that. So I think that's the way it's being implemented. Uh, CBAM, Carbon Border, Border Adjustment Mechanism, so essentially companies who are supplying uh, to Europe, typically products which are carbon intensive, GHG intensive, I mean carbon is GHG, greenhouse gas intensive, they will have challenges in terms of an indirect tax, taxation on that. EU <coughs> deforestation initiative, deforestation free product regulation which has come. So this is going to impact products, you know, typically agricultural products, typically, you know, products uh, from, uh, you know, like bovine animals, etc. All of these will get impacted if we are exporting to Europe. Make sure that we take care of all these initiatives and the EU taxonomy. Clearly, green taxonomy is something which has started, which is already there in Europe. So clearly more and more we'll see investments and initiatives towards the green environment in Europe. A bit about India now. Uh, businesses are changing the mindsets. Concept of just shareholders worth, what we read, what we studied, at least I studied in my college days, is no more valid. People are talking about stakeholders value. So shareholders, you know, we, we all learned at some point of time, I'm sure all of us must have learned, that the only purpose of business is enhancement of shareholders' value. You know, Milton Friedman. But today, that's not applicable anymore. Today, we're talking about stakeholders' value. Every, the value of every stakeholder has to go up. The value creation process is not limited to the top companies in India, just it, is, it, has, just, it has reached to several smaller companies because they are a part of the supply chain. The Indian framework of ESG reporting, BRSR, has started from this year, of course, as a mandate, for top 1,000 listed companies, as my previous speakers have mentioned. But it has also a very, very strong requirement of sustainable supply chain. So, so through the BRSR, it is not only the top companies are getting, they are touching the top companies, they are also touching the supply chain. Supply chain. Uh, financial institutes in India, you know, let me tell you, we are working with a home finance company. Imagine a home finance company. I want to go to take a home loan. I have to fulfill ESG criteria. Otherwise, I won't get home loan. Just imagine. Or maybe my home loan is going to be more expensive. So even ESG is being considered by NBFCs, by banks, by VC funds, everyone. And of course, we heard about mutual ESG mutual funds uh, from Dr. Gupta in the, you know, uh, you know, some time back. So this is what's happening in India. ESG parameters are included in the main risk portfolio of companies. So as I mentioned, the ERMs, ESG and climate risk are featuring. Indian boardrooms, Indian boardrooms who never possibly had an agenda to discuss about things which didn't start with a rupee or dollar or euro. 
Today, Indian boardrooms are having agenda which have no financial number, rupee, dollar. They are talking about non-financial agenda. That's very, very important. It was never, never there a few years back. And entrepreneurs are coming up. You know, more importantly, uh, I know and I, 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 I work with a lot of entrepreneurs who are bright, young people, uh, highly educated people uh, from Europe and the US. They have come back to set up, uh, you know, uh, uh, their, their, their enterprises to be a part of the India growth story. Things like people are producing animal protein from food waste, people are producing bioplastics, you know. All of these have started in the country. So that's a great, great initiative. And this is my last slide, incidentally. E Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, in fact, the ministry is coming within another five minutes. They are telling Delhi traffic. Okay, let us take it as ten minutes. So we need uh, our friends to set the dais, uh, this thing also. It's a humble request to both of sure, you. Sure, sure. <laughs> but you just uh, say some concluding word. And, sir, you will be always with us for all the program. Uh, for so later. should I take one more minute? Uh, you can conclude. Just, just, I'll just run one through. One or two minutes. This is my last slide. Okay. So typically what we have seen is on the E aspects, very clearly these are the concerns that we have in the Indian corporates. Major concerns are on biodiversity. Very few people are working on biodiversity, and of course others are there. Our biggest concern is, is S, diversity and inclusion. We just don't have. You know, just take out five companies, otherwise we don't have. I think we need to work on this. We need to work on the value chain outreach Value chain means, means supply chain as well as customers. We need to have impactful CSRs. And on the, on the G side, board independence is one aspect which is challenging, even today in most of the companies in India. So we have to keep this in mind. And of course, this is what I mentioned about. The new SEBI regulation touches all the supply chain. So it's very important that all the small companies are also being touched. And uh, I look at a, you know, a bright Indian ESG future. So on this promising note, I end my discussion. Jai Hind. OK. So uh, this is where I am, actually. I am on the is. So uh, before I do not have time to you know, uh, say with you what I intended to do, uh, I think uh, you need to cheer me up because I'm on the yes, the minister is on the way. So you cheer me up and I'll cheer you up. Okay. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I would be the uh, last speaker of uh, this seminar, I believe that everything has been covered. And uh, what is there for me to talk to you now? So I'm just wondering what. And then if I do not say something new, maybe the Institute would uh, never call me again to speak on such an event. <laughs> so, uh, uh, therefore, what I had to offer uh, is something really different. And that different is that uh, I suppose uh, that would be the purpose that you have all gathered here. Uh, that I mean business and I'm going to tell you something what is here. Uh, uh, for you all professionals because all of you are professionals so and all of you most of you may be the cost accountant therefore I promise you that I will not talk share any data I also promise that I will not say anything on the ESG because you have already digested it and maybe over digested most of you as well so here uh, if you could go to the next slide uh, can somebody help me uh, with that yes so, you know, um, the issues are, uh, when we are talking about the products, uh, uh, we were talking about the socially responsible product. And socially responsible product means com complying all the requirements that you have heard from the experts uh, since yesterday. Uh, you know, we are together here because there is a problem, there is a definite issue. And that issue, perhaps if you could recall, we could see from the previous session wherein we did find that 
the investment in health is more than the investment in the environment. And all of you analytically would wonder why it is so. And the reason is very simple, that there is a problem. You have a health issues and you can't let it go. Therefore, you have to spend that money on the health. Forget the environment because that's not just as close, as in, as your body that uh, disease is killing. So, therefore, this is a real problem and we need to recognize that uh, that is the reason that this problem we are discussing. But then, what is the way forward? Uh, and that we could uh, actually take from the perspective that, you know, what is the socially responsible product and what is not socially responsible product. And when we are saying that in the global point of view, I think India has uh, you know, facing these issues now because we uh, have just got into by circumstances in the global forum. We have compulsion not to be local anymore but to be global. And uh, then whatever is happening around us, we have to address that. And that issue is something which is bothering all and that is why we are all here. And uh, business may be bothering you, so you are here. But uh, there is a big problem which is bothering everybody and that is uh, the problem of uh, this climate change. Um, and uh, because of which the business may disrupt, the society may uh, ex extinct to the extent, you know, extinction I would say. So therefore something must be done. And for that matter, uh, there is an opportunity and a great opportunity for the people who really want to seize the moment. And there is a moment, and there is an India moment in the uh, scenario that we have. If you look at uh, uh, the, uh, the issues that are uh, there, they are primarily because, you know, there is an industry side uh, which is creating a lot of challenges to us. Uh, they happen to be, uh, uh, if I can, these are the sectors which are the problematic. Um, unless these sectors are dealt, the problem will not go. And unless such things keep will happening, uh, the problem will continue to remain there. Let's understand uh, whatever may be the talk we have, but human need and greed will not go, and social inequalities are going to be there. Therefore, the variety of product and services are continue to be there. Though the, uh, you know, uh, management systems standards would continue to be developed but the point of the fact is that social inequalities are going to be there uh, those issues are going to be there therefore some measures uh, you know breakthrough has to happen and therefore what is happening uh, that we need to see that how we conduct ourselves and that is where it comes the energy you know the fuel that we take let me say that the fuel which we take, the food that we are consuming today, need to be fundamentally changed if you want to improve your health. Therefore, similarly is the industry. Now, if we have to really, uh, uh, you know, keep this industry alive, we have to do something for this so that something can be done. And there is a great opportunity that what kind of a food, fuel that we could bring to this industry. Not reading this one, but see, uh, this uh, issue of uh, climate change, which is halting all the way, uh, is basically with the fuel system. Because as long as we continue to f burn the, bio f the, the fuel, uh, and you mind it that the carbon is not bad, right? How many of you agree? Is carbon bad? It's not bad. You, we all are emitting carbon even this point in time. So carbon is going to be there. The only issue is that how much is okay for us, how much is good for us that, you know, and how much is bad for us. So that's the debate that is happening here and you must have seen all the kind of a debates and dialogue, including the various frameworks that are available for you as a professionals to use. So what we can learn that India has to offer and what you as an entrepreneur to make a sustainable business. Cost accountant will have a role, um, you know, to fulfilling that aspirations that, you know, business competitiveness, where cost is a enabling factors to be a global player. 
that's one way to uh, the organization will be you know sustainable the other way will be that you offer something premium to the users and you become a leading organization profit making organization so what is happening in india given the scenario that india has india is blessed with so many things india is blessed with people like you beautiful people wonderful people intellectual people who can make the difference and india that way is geographically so well positioned so well placed that we, like we have a coastal line which is more than 70000 kilometers we have a such a good weather condition where we can produce solar all the time so solar is a massive aspect where we can uh, uh, you know go and we are already number one in the world but we can go far beyond and we can you know uh, go to the extent that we will be exporting uh, energies in different form not in the electricity form the other aspect that we are also exploring you would be very uh, many of you would know who are who are from tamil nadu that we tamil nadu is number one on the wind mills uh, again ele electricity so we have we are we are doing good on wind mills that's a socially responsible product you people agree it doesn't require it's not it's not uh, it's not using any fossil fuels so it's a natural energy that we are generating same is the solar so what is the uh, challenge now what is next happening what india will have as a transformative uh, you know chance to go to the next level is getting into the hydrogen as a fuel hydrogen as a hype and hydrogen is a future for sure so that is where all of us as a professional we will have to work together where the government of india has already rolled out the hydrogen uh, mission and there what are we looking at is i think that that is where uh, you have a job that we have to bring down the cost of hydrogen from 5 dollars to 1 dollar do that we will be number one and we will be also uh, on the top of world on the esg rating overall so thank you very much i think i have a uh, already the message with me so thanks for the opportunity and uh, hope that what i said in a brief make a lot of sense for you thank you so much i request tcs sir to be mk anand sir is there i request him to please come and express the thanks from heart mind and soul please as quickly as possible uh thank you very much papan bhai uh i thank all the learned speakers who are really very passionate but uh, afternoon sessions are really very risky sessions where uh, people after some test lunch are more uh, in uh, little slumber but i thank uh, ms settling for her very passionate uh, analysis and study ms ekta kumar for a very interesting uh, presentation shri sudipto das and dr birender rathori who really made uh, uh, the presentations in a very very interesting way for us all of us to uh, understand this these concepts i understand honorable minister is uh, on way so i i i thank all of uh, the learned speakers very much thank you very much